We farmed this land for many years, uh, drilled and planted different crops here. Just there, not even under a foot of earth, rolled out like an old Axminster carpet, sneaked in there, and no one noticed till the JCB. Well, George was um, digging back on his digger and uh, just pulled back the bucket and found all these little bits and pieces of uh, mosaic. So he came in to see us, didn't he? Yeah. And he said, you better come and have a look at this. And of course, it was like five o'clock in the evening, so it was getting pretty dark. So we didn't do much that evening, and then the next day we pondered on what to do, covered up, not say anything, or to call in the county archaeologist. The next morning we came out with a, sh with a shovel, and just going on like this, and just like going on a main road, wherever, which way you went, we found more mosaic. It uh, just kept on going, really. We ended up eventually getting through to uh, the Osborne family, and it's, it's largely thanks to them then saying, yeah, there have been some pieces of tessery from the ground, and there's a, a good number of pieces. We think you ought to come and have a look. So next day, um, we tried to arrange for Alan Graham, local archaeologist, who's literally only a mile up the road, to go out and have a look for us. The Osbournes, who were the owners of the land there, um, had cleaned up an area, I suppose, about the size of this table, about a, a metre square, very carefully. With, you know, they cleaned the soil off and washed it. Um, so that was all I could see. Immediately, what I thought was, well, how big is this mosaic? So I did a bit of simple scraping in various patches, because most of the topsoil was off, um, and realised that it was going beyond the edges of their excavation and was covering anything up to, you know, 20 metres square. Well, that, that first day when we found it ourselves, the, the colours were so bright and vivid, the blues and everything. Uh, I, I just think as the air got to it, you never saw those colours again, but... Uh, Maybe it's just excitement of finding it, I don't know. Well, I talked with them and, and said to them, yes, it's definitely Roman mosaic pavement of, of you know, exceptional quality. The colours were quite startling. The initial, initially clean mosaic was beautiful. Um, and we walked over the site and realised, you know, I showed them the extent how big it might be. There were also traces of rubble walls showing. So, you know, there's a lot more than just the mosaic floor. Um, and I said, well, you know, it's a site that is of great importance, completely unsuspected. Um, really what I ought to do is to go back to the county archaeologist, Bob Croft, and find out what we need to do about it. About 9.30 he rang up, Bob, oh, you better come and have a look. There is actually, you know, something far more important than we first thought. So we shot down there at 10.30 with my colleague Richard Brunning and uh, another lad, young lad, who was on work experience. His first day out, and there we were, within his first three hours, we were out there suddenly finding large chunks of mosaic all across the edge of the, the back garden of the Osborne family. I always wanted to find something, and I suppose this is a jackpot, really, isn't it? Finding this. Yeah, we, we were really, I was really excited when we found it. I phoned up English Heritage, David Miles, the chief archaeologist in London, and said, look, David, are you sitting down? We need a little bit of money, please, and um, how are you fixed? English Heritage is in the business of protecting the historic environment, but also investigating it so that we know more about it, and also uh, trying to make sure people can enjoy it as well, either by visiting it or reading about it. And uh, we do have some funding for, uh, for emergencies, because uh, quite often archaeology just turns up. We then appointed archaeological contractors in the form of uh, terrain archaeology, Pete Bellamy and Alan Graham and their team. They came in and basically they were on site then for the next three weeks till we'd finished doing all the work. I called in the CGR on the Sunday morning. Didn't I? Yes, yes that's right. Sunday you always come in Saturday, Saturday, Saturday Sunday mornings Sunday morning for, for a cup, cup of, of coffee. coffee. And I said, oh, there's a mosaic down the road. And John said, was it? So we went down and had a look, and we were yeah. so surprised yeah. that we actually walked all over it. <laughs> we kept the story fairly quiet. The word did get out that the mosaic had been discovered. A number of local people were coming up. I think everybody was absolutely incredulous. Um, I think there was nothing, nothing that had, had lifted the village. Um, that had ever happened before. And I think that, you know, there was this lovely, lovely buzz of enthusiasm. Have, have
Have you heard? Have you heard about the fire? Have you? Have you heard? The, and they found a dolphin now. And then I just got caught up in the excitement of it because I'd never really seen. Well, I don't suppose many people do see archaeology actually being discovered, and I just loved standing there and um, watching the archaeologists finding things. It was like an uh, old axe, Mr. Carpet, you know, in a way, with a. Uh, you know, the designs on the outside. I talked to this girl and I said, you know, do you, f do you find these, you know, often? <laughs> Which is a bit of a stupid thing to say, but when you know nothing about it, I mean, you imagine that people are always digging up Roman things. And she said, no, why do you think I'm here on a Sunday working voluntarily? <laughs> this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And that really made me realise how special it was. When I arrived at Lopen, it was a sea of mud. <laughs> and although there were reports of a mosaic being there, it was so covered in slurry that one could hardly see it. We cleaned the mosaics, the, visible, the two visible mosaics, the corridor and the, the big room. Um, there were other rooms in the building, and it looks as if in the mid-4th century there was a, a major rebuilding of it, and I think that suggests to me that the room the mosaic was in was built for that room. They, they rebuilt the building and floored it with mosaics. Uh, we wanted to establish what kind of building this mosaic was in. So our geophysics team, who were based at the Centre for Archaeology in uh, Portsmouth, uh, they came along. Uh, what we wanted to do is to see if we could actually get the plan of the Roman villa in order to see where the mosaic was in relation to the building and, of course, how big the building was, because Roman villas can be massive. Unfortunately, it didn't work, because uh, the Lopen site's very low-lying, the soils are quite clay and they're, qu and they're quite damp and that's the worst possible conditions for geophysics. So we still don't know the exact size and shape and plan of the Roman villa at Lopen. It was recorded in, in two ways. Traditional method, which is the archaeological survey planning at 1 to 20 scale and uh, Dr. David Neal and Steve Koch came down to record the geometric patterns and they worked out the whole geometry and they did a, a wonderful job on that and that work will be published later this year. But in addition to that, because of the help and involvement of English Heritage who'd already done the geophysical survey, they then came in with the photogrammetric team from York, based in York under the guidance of Paul Bryan, which is basically setting up a camera on a tripod and then uh, overlapping photographs are then taken of the mosaic. Then that material is taken on board, digitally scanned in, and a, a huge photogrammetric, properly measured and uh, accurately worked out uh, image is then retrieved, which is done on the computer. The man from Taunton said that there was one found exactly like it in London. I suppose he, see, he said they went around with a book showing the sure. people the patterns they wanted, you know, <laughs> just like a carpet salesman. Yeah, but I don't did. know if it worked like that, but yeah. that's what he said. In order to date things properly, ideally you dig through them and you're looking for dating of the layers below the floor. But with this particular example, it, the pattern, the yeah. geometric design is virtually identical to one in London. Now this is the design as a Lopen mosaic should have been. You recognise this corner is almost identical. Yes, it is, yes, and the pattern. Yes, and, of course, here we have the same canthui in similar panels mm -hmm. in the angles here and here. In the same frame. Yes. And this feature here, this lozenge, is on, lope, on the lopen mosaic, as is this and this. We were lucky, as the, as the sort of time went on, the weather improved and it was very late in the year so the sun was extremely low. That's the photograph, the close-up photograph I took with a longer lens and the first time I printed that I was just absolutely thrilled when it came out of the developing tray because I wasn't terribly hopeful that black and white was going to add anything to the picture and the mosaic is about colour really but um, this picture to me is just well, I, I prefer it to all the colour ones I've seen because you can see the, the design and the pattern so clearly. Here's a piece of tessery from Lopen. And we have a look at its characteristics, its thickness, its colour, its, its uh, roughness, its, its texture and so on, how, how it fractures. We can then compare it 
with actual rocks in quarries. Now this particular one is very similar to a piece of rock I got from Charlton Mackerel and the colour, thickness, texture and so on very very similar indeed. <clears throat> Here we are in the quarry itself but lower down are some thin planar beds and this is probably uh, where the tessery came from. Actually, what was particularly interesting is that this porticus, you came along the porticus mm. and then you came into the northern part of the mosaic room and there in front of you was the alcove. Yes. That was a very interesting point about this mosaic mm. is, and the room is that it had effectively three units. This was the threshold. You came across this mosaic, which is essentially an arrangement of octagons, and facing you was this alcove. On your left-hand side, I'm sorry, on your right-hand side as you came in, was th the room was in, expanded to the area that is covered by this square mosaic. And the two areas of the room were separated by what we call response, small projecting walls, one here, another one just here. So the Mosaicist, when they started their work, um, put in a very neat border arranged at a precise width around all around the walls and then uh, laid this arrangement of intersecting um, uh, interlaced squares. But unfortunately, the Mosaicist made a major error in the, in the layout. But this is where he started and as he worked in this direction, he realised that he made a mistake and then started to distort and squeeze in the patterns in order to get it within the limits that he had imposed upon himself. The scheme of interlaced squares has almost become a scheme of interlaced rectangles. And this should originally have been at the centre of the floor. That's right. It's slightly off centre. Um, it, it's, it's a saltar design in the shape of a St Andrew's cross. And in the arms you have these peculiar little, pel what we call pelter urns, sort of a cross between a f an urn and a, a plant form. Now the most interesting features of this, this floor are the representational art, if you were. Uh, because this room may have been a dining room, it is no surprise that we have wine cups featured. Now these are imitation golden vessels with jewelled bands across them. There are two on this floor. Also at the southern end, uh, unusually only one example, in one of the half uh, interlaced squares, is a fine rendition of a dolphin. This was the feature that was in all the, the newspapers. But what they missed was a tiny little fish blowing bubbles. And we didn't find this until we were actually cleaning it at the same time as I was drawing it. Mm, yes. As, in fact, I drew it before I realised what I was drawing. You see, this is the only part of the room that survives. I should imagine, David, that this had fine painted walls. Oh, absolutely. And, and, of course, ceilings, painted and ceilings. ceilings. And furniture. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, in, in the Arco, for example. The mosaics are dated probably AD 360 because a coin of 355 was found underneath a mosaic of ident virtually identical type mm. at a site 15 miles away or so at Halstock. The core of it is clearly a high-status building. You don't have that sort of investment in a small farmhouse. It may well be the wealthy country residence of someone who's involved in other activities in the Roman province, such as commerce or business or administration even. But they were British people who'd uh, been successful in the Roman Empire. They were living in grand houses which were probably not matched until the 20th century in terms of the comforts of the bathhouses, the underfloor heating systems, the luxury of the decorations, the use of window glass. Even in the 19th century, the grand houses of the 19th century were probably not as comfortable as a 4th century Roman villa of the very best sort, and that's what this is. 
So it's a major piece of real estate, and the family that lived in it would have been very wealthy. What the mosaic really shows us, though, is that all, in spite of the fact that they were British and living in Somerset, they had aspirations to be educated Romans. And so the floor is actually telling visitors, it's telling people who came to the site that we're a rich, well-educated and sophisticated family. Uh, we identify with being Roman and uh, we're spending a lot of our money on a mosaic like this in order to show you that we really are somebody. It's a ceremonial room. You would have had formal dinners and lots of formal dinners. Um, you may also have given audiences to your to people on your estate in this room, so it might have had a, a, a um, administrative or business function as well. Again, it's designed to impress your visitors with your importance. Unfortunately, of course, um, shortly after this mosaic was built, or at least maybe a, a century after this mosaic was built, it all collapsed. And, uh, and somewhere around about 400 to 450, the whole system just really goes to pot and uh, you could no longer maintain a villa. And that's partly because your market economy's gone, but also with that, so go all the craftsmen, so the people who would have maintained your central heating system, who would have made your window glass, or have built mosaics, uh, they disappear. And uh, so the farming still continues, of course, because people still have to eat. But what you, what you then get in the fifth century is a reversion to a kind of peasant economy the villa would be abandoned uh, to gradually fall down and people would rob it, uh, take, you know, they no doubt would have uh, looted it to a certain extent or used the stone for, for building material elsewhere. I think that is basically the fate of an awful lot of the Roman ruins, is they are plundered for stone and the sites are levelled. They even go as far as taking out the foundations, so you get trenches where the walls were and all the stone's gone. Mosaic floors are not really reusable so they were just left. I was genuinely surprised, really, to see something suddenly appearing on the edge of the village like that. It's also the finest mosaic I've ever, see, I've ever seen uh, appear in, during my career in the last 30 years. And I mean, I'm a specialist in Roman archaeology, but I'd, I've never seen a mosaic as fine as that before. I suppose we did two weeks' work before the official publicity launch of the, of the find. The local press picked it up, the national press picked it up, and Alan kneeling down, troweling the dolphin. That picture went all across the world. It's uh, put Lopen on the map, really. It's given Lopen a, a, a name at last. <laughs> I was amazed at the interest that it, it generated. The crowds were tremendous. Unbelievable. I've never, never seen mm. so many cars in Lopen, never more dogs. But Ben's father's over 80, yeah. or 80 the other yeah. day, and he'd never seen anything in Lopen like oh, he no. told me. Last weekend, it was absolute chaos. There's just people everywhere, people coming across the hedges, across the fields. <laughs> Something like three and a half thousand people visited the site every day. It was ten deep on the edge of the trenches all day. We won an award for the best find of the year. Um, yeah, it was, it was absolutely fantastic, the find. It was just wonderful to be able to talk to people about archaeology when you've got something like that to show them, to have it under your feet. It's, there's no better time to tell people about archaeology. Archaeologists can go through their entire careers without seeing something as great as the Lopen mosaic, you know, so it's a privilege to be there when it uh, turns up. It's a classic, unexpected discovery. It's significant, isn't it? It's just very exciting and very beautiful. It's a wonderful piece of, of provincial art, you know, on that basis alone, it's an exciting, wonderful discovery. But I think it also is a reminder and a pointer to the complexity of, of the past of Britain that we all live in. Dolphin seems to be swimming, snub-nosed and lively in a sea of geometry, past Patina seeking the light of day, waves of tessera that echo on the foreshore, green grass and trowels digging, precise the scraping away. It was
was really a kitchen table conversation. Um, and Nick Dernan, uh, who subsequently did the work on it, because he's a, he's a, a sculptor conservator. Um, and it was, well, I wonder if there's any way of there being something that, that can be kept hopefully within the village, but certainly very locally, that would remind us clearly of these, these three incredible weeks. The other thing that was, seemed to be very important was that for those people who were able to see it, um, it would probably stay fresh in their memories for a long time. But there were an awful lot of people who didn't have the opportunity to see it in those three weeks. So for them, there was nothing real. There was the tale that it had happened, but there was nothing that actually said this was in Lopen. And so it became apparent that it would be useful to have something that was tangible, um, untouchable. And from there, the, the idea of reconstructing part of it was born. Well, one thing that um, really excited me about the whole project was that I realised that there were literally thousands of little tesserae pieces, mosaic pieces, just in the ground, which were being collected by the bucket load, by the tray load, um, by, by the archaeologists. And I just found you know, many pieces myself just looking in the spoil heaps. Um, so I thought, as it's all going to be covered over, wouldn't it be um, good for the village um, an exciting, and an exciting project for everyone if we could use all those loose pieces to reconstruct one of the panels from the mosaic. We wanted to, to work on something that would give a sense of completeness of part of it. And when you looked at the images that we had of it, the only ones that were complete were very limited and the, the cantharis was one. What also seemed to be important was to involve as many people as wanted to be involved in the process. So, in fact, you know, there's quite a, there's quite a bit of movement there. Each tesserae, in theory, and you've got nice geometrical squares, each tesserae is a different size. Mm -hmm. You see how that affects the, the regularity of it. So we started off by launching the project, when, when the funding first came through, of having a tesserae sorting weekend, and we called it a 1,400-year-old jigsaw. The sizes we want are these, these smaller ones here, that size. The major sort of initial task was sorting out all these pieces and trying to find out whether we had enough. So we had to carefully clean and carefully sort out all the pieces and just see whether you know we had the right colours and the right number of pieces for this design. having a, a drawing done of the cantharis and getting people to try and match the shape and size onto this drawing um, and building it up that way. It was a fascinating weekend and the conversation and having people really touching the, the tessera for the first time since the mosaicist had originally laid them with the exception of the archaeologist who would have fished out the pieces and put them in a box. So this wonderful direct contact with something that was 2,000 years old. And that lovely magic, and you'd say, in particular to children, you'd say, well, who would have last touched the underside of that piece? Oh. Oh. Oh, the Romans! And it was, I mean, it really was wonderful. The next stage is putting it on a stone backing piece so that it can be permanently displayed. 
Um, so that'll be that'll be its permanent home once everything is fixed there in lime mortar. At the moment, you can see all these pieces are just loose. There's nothing holding them together. We've just placed them where we think they should go. This is a piece of the original mortar, and you can see this uh, coarse Roman mortar with lots of crushed brick and crushed lyrestone made of lime. And the pieces themselves would have been fixed onto that with another layer of lime mortar. So we've had this analysed, and we know that it's got sand and lyrest and brick and lime in it. So I'm using exactly the same materials as the Romans would have done to make the mortars for, for fixing these pieces into place. You can see all these little marks I've been making in the stone, which is like a key to hold the lime plaster. So I'll put a layer of lime plaster over here, and then I will need to mark out the outline of the design. You can see on the drawing, you can see the grid, the geometry, the spacing of the design. So I shall, on top of my first layer of plaster, mark out these lines, um, as a guide for when we come to place the tesserae in place. As it was worked, we realised how incredibly skilled the mosaicists were. Um, they were obviously craftspeople, but, and that's, that's what they did. Um, but even given that, how um, elaborate and how expensive it must have been. These are some of the larger pieces of Roman tesserae that were found on site. And these are the sort of pieces that I've been cutting down to size to make these much smaller pieces, which uh, form part of this design. And when you look closely at these, these pieces of Roman tesserae, you can see that obviously a piece has got several faces to it. This is the worn face. This is the side that would have been walked on in Roman times. But the other faces, you see, are quite rough and they've got remnants of lime mortar. So that this stone would have been squeezed into the mortar and you can see the remains of the Roman mortar all around the outside. It's very hard to make an exact cube from a piece of lyre stone. It just doesn't cut very neatly. You don't saw it, you actually hit it with a hammer and chisel. See, it's roughly a cube, um, but you know that you couldn't call it a real cube. You've got different angles on the sides and different shaped edges. So they're all like this. The closer you look at them, the more you realise that there isn't actually a perfect cube there. They're all just um, approximations to that. Making enough tesserae for this isn't too big a problem. And I think in here we haven't counted them precisely, but we think there's between two and a half thousand and three thousand pieces in this design. Well, that, that might just be a, a groove in... Right. I don't know. I'm just wondering yeah. whether... Well, I could make it more swirl-like. Was, my tendency was to make it really swirl-like. Yes. But they've got a really big blob in the middle of there, so I thought... Oh. You need all the right pieces to yeah, fit round. Yeah, you do, you do. I, I think there's something I'm sure it could, it could, yeah. it's just like, okay. you see it comes, I reckon it comes around and then you've got that bit yeah. there as the final central bit and when you come around here and uh -huh. you've got that bit in the middle so I th kind of think it needs it one does, piece yes. that looks a bit round that sits in the middle. I reckon. Uh, it did look as if somebody was on the outside probably cutting the pieces of, of Tessera and passing them through to the person that was actually working on them on the inside because they found some little heaps of cut but unwalked um, stone on the outside of the wall. And this gives a sort of human dimension to this beautiful, beautiful design. There would have been master craftsmen who, who came up with the designs, had pattern books, could do all the drawing and were running the whole project. 
and then you would have various levels of craftsmen. Um, I would, perhaps you had some craftsmen who did the simpler borders, and then more highly skilled craftsmen who, who did the more freehand designs of vases and heads and foliage and that sort of thing. So I would think there would have been a hierarchy. There would have been someone mixing the lime mortar, someone creating the tesserae, uh, someone else drawing all the lines on the, uh, on the floor itself, and other people placing them, other people grouting them in and polishing the surface. So. I think there would have been several, several skills involved. You do. <laughs> yep. Done. So this is a little bit like a conservation job with a difference because um, obviously one's conserving the original material but putting it together in a new way um, and solving the problems, trying to work out how the Romans did it and what the right techniques are to use for it. Um, does have a creative aspect to it. Should we, should we the ones that put it in the back? I suppose there's two aspects that I really enjoy. One is handling the Roman material, knowing that these stones were all Roman stones and were once in the floor. And secondly is learning all the techniques that the Romans would have used. Good. touching the tessera and feeling the angular underfaces and that smoothed face and that could only have been smoothed by feet. That was the thing that made me feel as if I was in direct contact with the predecessors of this village. All I want to say is that none of this could have been possible if it hadn't been for the grant that we were given by um, the Countryside Agency and the Local Heritage Initiative. So it was just wonderful that they decided to support this project. So right, get, get it brushing and you can, you can reveal. What is it, Alex? There you go. In trying to think of the right place within the church, not at the beginning of the project being absolutely clear as to how it was going to work out, that it had been thought that it would go on the wall as a picture. But then it seemed to make much more sense for it to be on the floor. And with consultation with the church and with church architects, the final place is where it should be, which is under people's feet. And so its final resting place is going to be here. So when you see it next time, you too will be able to walk on it, just as your predecessors did 2,000 years ago. The mosaic has now been tucked up for the winter under a foot of soil, rich colours returned to the earth, geometry rippling, the show over, the curtain closed, a memory of something wonderful lurking down by the brook. Well, there came a point we'd done all that we could do in terms of cleaning and exposing the remains that were there. We then obviously had to do detailed rec records of it all. Um, walls and walls and the trenches and ditches and things were recorded by the archaeologists, myself and my team. The actual floor itself was recorded in lots of ways by um, drawing, photography, 
and a very detailed photogrammetric survey, a sort of mosaic of photographs done by English Heritage. But then the question did arise, what to do next? I think that everybody's initial reaction to, to the site and to the mosaic was, ah, you know, it's got to be kept open, it's got to be available for public display, you know, this, this must be done. Um, and it took quite a lot in saying to people, well, well just a moment, where the roads are as they are, um, where would people park? And how would you keep it protected? And how would you keep the frost out? It's safely buried. It isn't lost. We know exactly where it is. We've got uh, wonderful photographs. You can go and uh, have a look at the photographs. But it is not lost. It's, it's there. And um, in the light, the fact that we don't have several tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds to lift it and then find a room large enough to put it on display, um, the best place for it, for the, for the short term, medium term at the moment, is to leave it where it is. The mosaic travels from the edge of the gravel, probably to here, that square, and uh, there is a little little corridor leading off there, and another little room here, which the mosaic disappeared for over the years, and two little lead-off rooms there. I mean, I, they say it's within the top ten largest mosaics in the country, don't they? I felt it was a shame it had to be covered up oh, again. Yeah, really, that, yeah, you know, yeah, I don't yeah. know. You know what could be done. You know, it'd be lovely to be able to show it, wouldn't it? But, uh, for future reference. If, yes, yeah. it's, uh, like I say, sure it would have been a big attraction oh, for Oh goodness me! They yeah. advertised the yeah. property. Yeah, and makes you wonder how much more is there. Oh, that's you right. know, they really dig I up. mean, the corridors were running away right towards the river and that. Yeah. You know, they could and have dug was, a lot more. Yes, yeah. if they could have dug a lot more, you know. We know that you just can't uncover mosaics and leave them uncovered because they can be so susceptible to damage and covering mosaics with soil is one of the best ways of preserving them. I mean, as you know, it, it's so obvious really. They've been under the ground, 12 inches, two feet below the surface, perfectly preserved for 1,500 years or more. No, I mean, it's not harm, it's just sitting there, isn't it? It's bedded down, it's been there for 1,700 years, so it's not, not going anywhere, is it? <laughs> Well, unless they want to, English Heritage want to lift it, perhaps and put it in a museum, yeah. but that's, um, that's up to them. Ball's on their court there. Victorian archaeologists would have probably done that. They'd have probably lifted it up and taken it to a museum somewhere. In fact, you can go to the British Museum and see some very spectacular mosaics uh, uh, there. Uh, our approach is different now. Our, pro our approach is much more to try to preserve things where they were made. And the major reason for not taking it out now is that, uh, also, we don't know very much about the villa itself. Uh, for example, the, the big mosaic uh, in the dining room is attached to the corridor mosaic outside, but we don't know what that's attached to. The geophysical survey didn't show the plan of the villa. You imagine trying to lift a mosaic of that size and relay it. First, you've got to have somewhere to relay it. You have to have that technology to lift it. Um, and there is the beginning of a feeling that preservation in situ is better because then it's still part of the building to which it belongs. You know, a mosaic pavement laid in the British Museum or in the or relayed in the British Museum or say Taunton Museum, although visible to the public, is divorced from its context. But at the moment it would be a bit like pulling somebody's tooth out without being able to see the face, if you see what I mean. It, uh, it, would be a, it would leave a kind of gaping hole in a building that we don't understand. And at the moment, it's perfectly safe and stable where it is. And so, from a conservation point of view, it's uh, better, we felt, to leave it where it, uh, where it had been laid, because we'd rather see it as part of that building rather than take it out and make it into something more like a picture on a wall. I think it was staying under here, actually. I think it's the best place for it, really. Uh, because it takes mega money to uh, bring it bring it open again. It's got to have heating and uh, glass over the top and everything. Oh, so I've been told, uh, I just it's just a big, vast area, really, to uncover. Mm. The truth of the matter is, is that when mosaics have been found in the past and cover buildings have been put over them, there is enormous enthusiasm at first 
for these discoveries. But then that enthusiasm wanes. The buildings um, then cease to become popular. They become uh, problems. Yeah, I think it's probably priceless, but worthless, isn't it? I mean, it, it's a one hell of a thing to have, but on the other hand, it's, it's, it's worth nothing, really. What we now know about the Lopen site, what we now know about its context and position, I'm reasonably happy that it can stay where it is. Um, buried, it's safe, it's in the garden. Uh, the long-term protection, I think, English Heritage need to, to get that in hand. Um, we can negotiate um, about significance and extent and all that, but I think it is of sufficient importance to become a, a nationally important scheduled monument and um, quite happy to leave it where it is. What uh, would be useful would be to put in some more evaluation trenches to try to find out how big the, the, the villa is where it runs, it may run under some of the modern buildings, of course, uh, but how extensive it is, uh, see if we can get the, the plan. And also, of course, it's highly likely there'd be more mosaics there, because uh, an, own, an owner of this kind of wealth usually has a few. I'd love to see it again. <laughs> Whether we will, I don't know. I don't think we'll ever will, but it's there. Thank you.